Good morning. My name is Mark Hawkins. I'm the business manager from Local 24, located in Denver, Colorado. I've been an iron worker for 35 years and a business manager for 10 years. A little bit about Local 24. 24 means we're the 24th local ever chartered in the United States and Canada. Our charter date was July 2nd, 1901. Our geographical jurisdiction is 500 by 1,000 miles. That's the entire state of Colorado and a good portion of the state of Kansas. We recently just opened a new training facility in Wichita, Kansas, and prior to that, we opened a facility in Denver, Colorado. This is a picture of a class at the Denver training facility, and in a moment, I'm going to share a story with you about this picture. Today, we're going to talk about the Safety Train Supervisor Construction Program, also referred to as the STSC program. Our main topic is safety certification as a safety force multiplier. I'm going to briefly talk about why and how Local 24 got involved in training in the SDSC. I'm going to talk about the benefit to the membership and also the benefit to the local union. But the heart of our presentation is a case study on the positive outcome achieved when implementing the STSC program on a power plant in Michigan. And this will be presented by John Isham. John is the Senior Safety Director for the Power Business Unit of AECOM. He's a certified industrial hygienist and a certified safety professional. Also accompanying him will be Mike Listello. Mike is the safety, or Supervisor of Safety and Industrial Hygiene. He's a certified safety professional for DTE Energy. I'm going to talk about the benefits to, I just told you that. Um, sorry about that, guys. Yeah, lost it a little bit. So why did Local 24 get involved in training in the STS program? A moment ago, I told you I have been an iron worker for 35 years. Many of you in this room have been in this industry 20 years or more. What does it mean to tell somebody you've been in this industry 20 years or more? It means you participate in a time frame when there are absolutely no rules, none whatsoever. If I ask you where the first VPP project was, VPP means Voluntary Protection Program. It's a partnership where the owner, construction management, or employer can partner with OSHA, and they say their standards are going to be higher than was mandated by OSHA. Well, the first BP project in the United States was in northern Colorado in 1982 on a powerhouse called Rawhide. And then if I ask you, who were the first two individuals ever terminated from a VPP site? I guarantee you don't know the answer to that one. You're looking at one of them, and the other one is my brother, Doug. We were connecting on that powerhouse, and they came up to us and said, you know what, we are now a VPP site, you've got to tie off to connect. We said, no way. It says, if you don't tie off to connect, we're going to terminate your employment. So they terminated our employment. A week later, they call us back up and says, you know what, we made a mistake. Please come back. You don't have to follow those rules. So we went back. But you want to know what happened? When they called us up and says, hey, we made a mistake, those rules don't apply to you. And when I look back at this, it's very upsetting. What happened was when they called us up and says those rules don't apply to you, an opportunity was missed. And an opportunity was missed because in 1982, there was a group of people who knew, who knew we had to change our industry. And it's taken from 1982 all the way to today to get to that point. And if you've been in this industry 20 years or more, you've been involved or seen a crane accident, you know somebody who's been hurt, whether it's an employee or a friend, and worse yet, and worse yet, there's a few of us in this room who's held somebody in our arms when they took their last breath. And when you hold somebody in your arms when they take that last breath, that moment and that name is forever seared, and I mean seared, into your heart, your soul, and your mind. So that's why Local 24 is adamant about training and the STSC program. So how do we get involved in the STSC program? After 2008 and we started to climb out of the recession, we knew there's going to be an opportunity for safety personnel. So we started a committee, and the goal of the committee was to develop their skill sets. We brought all these different people in to talk to this committee. And finally, we brought this guy named Chris Matheson, the labor liaison for OSHA. It took Chris but a moment to figure out our problem. He says, you're working on the skill sets of these guys. They've got the experience, but they don't have any certification behind their name. So he told us about the STSC program, excuse me, he told us about the Board of Certified Safety Professionals and the certification we could get. So we looked into it and said, that was the direction we were going to go. But there's always more of the story. So at that time frame, our man hours were down, a lot of money wasn't coming in, and we wanted to spend a lot of money. So we went to our membership and said, listen, 
says, we want to spend this money, and this is why we want to spend it. So we put in a formal resolution, and they passed it unanimously. And I often wonder if I would be standing here today talking about the STSC if my membership hadn't had the initiative to pass a resolution to go down this road. So my hat always goes off to my membership. So what's the benefit to the member? So if you don't take anything else away I talk about today, remember one thing. Training in the STSC develop a culture of safety. Think that through. Training in the STSC develop a culture of safety. Imagine this guy, and I was this guy. I studied for my STSC exam. I go to the Pearson View testing facility. I take that exam. At that moment of reckoning, I got to hit that Smith button. I hit that Smith button. That word pass comes across. You want to talk about a feeling of accomplishment? Now that guy's working for you on your project. And then imagine being that guy who's been in this industry 20, 25, 30 years. He's beat up and broke down. Now he's got an opportunity to extend his career that five, that 10, that 15 years. So what's the benefit to the, the local union? So my conversation now is between me and every business manager in here. You know what we are? We are CEOs of businesses. And rule number one of any business is you got to cover cost. How do we cover cost? We cover cost by man hours. So think of the SDSC and training as one tool. We stand here today, we take care of our business today, but we're already one, three, five, ten years down the road. So let's talk about the three-year business plan. Local 24 has 47 individuals with this STST certification. We have two with a CHST and one with a CET. Those are higher certifications. The three-year plan is that we are partnering with the GCs. We now invite GCs into all our classes. We have a class last weekend with 25 participants. The weekend, every quarter going forward, we have an STSC class. We want the GCs to come into our class. And the reason we want them to come in is we want to get that partnership. So when they have the ability to pick that employer to do their work, they're going to already have a relationship with Local 24, and they're going to pick one of our signatory contractors because they know the value of us. So. <laughs> What's the story with this picture? I'm in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm meeting with a couple employers, trying to talk them to come to Colorado and Kansas to do work. I text message the guy who works for me. His name's Joe Morey. He says, Joe, how's it going? He sends me this picture. He says, Joe, is everything all right? I don't hear a word from him. I'm freaking out. I'm worried about the cops. I'm worried about the fire department. I'm worried about our neighbors. I'm worried about unruly iron workers. And more important, I am worried about the guy teaching the class whose name's Chris Matheson, who's the labor liaison for VPP, or for OSHA. And he's teaching a VPP class. So on a side note, Local 24 is trying to make our Denver training facility the first VPP training facility partnership with OSHA. So if I'm out there sitting in your shoes right now, looking back here, I think the question you're asking me is, how do you get 150 people on a Wednesday night at 6 p.m. to take a VPP class given by some guy from labor, from OSHA. So this is pretty much a controversial and difficult conversation. Local 24 mandates training in our collective bargaining agreement. If you don't take a certain amount of training, you make $7 less an hour on your paycheck. I tell the guys, you don't have to take the training, but if that employer pays you one penny over that negotiated rate, I'm going to file a grievance on them. If I still got a problem, I'll take them to the National Labor Relations Board. I'm going to tell you right now, we've got the best employers anywhere in the country because a long time ago, we figured out the benefit of a partnership and the benefit of training. So in conclusion, I've got two messages. First message is for everybody in this room and everybody outside this room who's not an iron worker. I promise and guarantee Mark Calkins, Local 24, Every local in our international, impact international, will never ever miss an opportunity like we missed in 1982. And we promise we'll do everything we can to make sure you've got the best trained and the safest iron workers on your project, guaranteed. And my final message, my final message is a challenge. I challenge our general officers, our district council presidents, our business managers, our business agents, our apprenticeship coordinators, and trainers 
to get your STSC certification. Let's not drive this certification only from the bottom up. Let's also drive it from the top down. Let's show our industry that we are accountable and credible and that we will make sure that union iron workers are the true leaders in our industry. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John and Mike as they present a case study on the positive outcomes achieved when implementing the STSC on a power plant in Michigan. So, thank you. Good morning. Uh, really exciting to be here, and thank you for the, the invite to speak today on, on behalf of uh, AECOM and and uh, one of our big clients, DTE Energy. Again, I'm John Isham with uh, AECOM. And what is AECOM? In its current, rather new form, it's a group of uh, legacy companies back going back to Morrison Knudsen, MK Ferguson, Washington Group International, if any of those names ring a bell. More recently, uh, URS, and AECOM has acquired Hunt Construction. If you go to uh, any nearby ballpark, they've probably built that and have several stadiums under construction, and that includes Tishman, which obviously is a high-rise contractor uh, in the east, in particular New York. So collectively, we're 100,000. On any given day, we operate in 26 countries and probably all 50 states. Um, so it's a really exciting time for us to bring a lot of legacy together. Um, and for us to talk about STS, it's been a part of our culture for a long time on, on the construction side of AECOM, and it's being taken globally across the company now because it's been proven out to really change cultures and be a benefit to the company. So our objectives really talk, teach you a little bit about STS, the benefits, the process, the values, and the case study, uh, the value to owners, and certainly us as a client bringing that to, to to uh, uh, contractors bring it to the clients. What is it? Uh, it's a board of certified safety professional, professional national certification. You get to wear those letters by your name. Uh, they have a booth out here if you haven't noticed. Uh, the CEO of the BCSP is, is, is at the booth. Please stop by. You'll probably have a few questions after some of what you've heard today. Uh, but they, they administer all the national professional safety certifications and this particular certification is for non-safety people, okay? So it's built for this audience, and it's built for companies, large and small, to advance their safety culture. It's not focused on, on uh, OSHA compliance. You need to know your regulations, and this is all exam-based when you get to that point. Uh, but it's really focused on supervisor safety responsibilities. Uh, what that means is when you operate at a project, even in your office environments, we need safety leadership and you need to know how to apply both OSHA and the safety culture in your, in your organization. And as Mark mentioned, it's a differentiator in safety for you personally, against your peers, for us as a company, and for certain clients. So why focus on supervisors? This hasn't changed in a few decades that I know of. But safety is, has, and always will be a function of first-line supervision. Doesn't mean the rest of us are cut out of responsibility. Okay, everyone has a, has a big role in safety. But first-line supervision is where boots on the ground, where it's most effective. That's where the work happens. That's where the biggest risk is. So for years and years and years, it's nothing new. We have to focus on uh, doing a better job on supervisor performance. In AECOM, you can look at this list. Um, our supervisors look like they need to be safety professionals, and in a way they do. This is a typical uh, list for a field project. If you look at it, it's all about planning, communication, identific identification, correcting, reporting safety, okay? And I'm gonna, I'll be the first to admit, in our company, we've done a poor job preparing supervisors to do all this. We bring them in, we throw them through an orientation, maybe a couple hour foreman training, go hit it, buddy, it's, it's all yours. And they struggle with this. Until we did STS, we really didn't have the confidence or the results we wanted expecting this of, of our supervisors. Again, why? That's how many fatalities we had uh, in the latest statistics on construction. Okay, we can always use this to bring out a little emotion. There's always faces with those numbers. And as you heard earlier today, it's about zero injuries, zero incidents. And this is really a key way to get there. 
All right, just a couple pictures here. Um, obviously, no safety, no training, no supervisors, okay? So as I mentioned, STS is really our key platform. It doesn't mean that our employees can just go take the exam and magic things happen. What that exam does, it, it builds the culture through their engagement and their commitment, and we can roll out a lot of additional, very proactive, very aggressive safety, and we know where they're, they're bought in. They're, they're drinking the Kool-Aid, they're certified, they're all on board. So we can do some really um, extraordinary things with safety as STS gets rolled out. And as a platform, that's all it is. You start there, and good things happen um, as, you, as you roll out and advance your process. Our main message is leadership drives culture, culture drives safety. So building that leadership, commitment, understanding through certification, they, they will drive the culture and therefore the safety results happen. So in AECOM, what groups do we focus on? Obviously, we talked about the project level, foreman level, supervisor level. Uh, we've advanced it beyond that. We start with our designers and engineers. We're really big in safety and design. There's different terms for that, but it's a key factor in constructing these jobs safely. So I think uh, those of you who have been on a project where this is in place, you do a lot more work on the ground, you construct modules, you, you know, part of uh, Mike's presentation is, is geared towards that, uh, how successful this culture can make a job safer by doing more work on the ground. Uh, so our designers and engineers are engaged. Uh, we have our group leaders, our safety committees. Those are key people. Um, they, they like to advance their own safety knowledge. And what I'm most impressed with is our senior executives all have it. Uh, so do our project managers. So you go on a project site, they're going to be STS as their staff. And you know, that makes my job quite a bit easier when they're bought in like that and, and taking the lead in safety. Okay, about the process, if this might be new to you, uh, there's, there's an application process, but you have to have a little experience. Two years as a supervisor, uh, so as an iron worker professional, or four years in the industry, okay? So you don't have to be a supervisor, but you, but you need a minimum of four years. And for the STSC, it would be construction. I use the term STS because we were engaged in this when it, it was just STS, and there was multiple um, focus areas for STS. There's mining, there's a mining test, petrochemical, general industry, and construction. They've narrowed those down to STS or STSC. We allow people in our company to take both. Clearly you guys are focused on STSC. There's 30 hours of education. That can be your formal OSHA training or you know it can be a 15-minute safety meeting if you document it. It could be an orientation to a new project. Document it. Uh, so I imagine people get that pretty easy, um, being in, being in uh, the iron workers, but if, you, if you're going to pursue it, look up those documents and start collecting those. There's an application process. Once, once approved, you have four months to take a, uh, your exam. It's a 100 question, and it's at a Pearson View Test Center. They're, they're located across the United States. It's not easy. You've got to prepare. And national passing is about 73%, and that's coming up slowly because I think we're be doing a better job preparing uh, people to take the test. In AECOM, I'll brag a little bit, we're probably pushing high 80s, maybe 90, because we really spent a lot of time getting uh, training and practice materials to the people who, who want to pursue STS. And those have been shared with, with impact. OSHA quote. I love this because OSHA doesn't uh, really promote or endorse anything. They're very careful about it. But in this statement, I'll read the second sentence. Employees having an STS construction certified supervisor on a work site will be viewed by inspectors favorably with the understanding that the construction site is being operated by individuals with demonstrated knowledge, ability, and an indicator of the contractor's commitment to an effective safety and health program. That's pretty powerful. I don't think I can say that better myself. So we have our regulators believing in, in the STS. Values to, to our company employees, we've asked them, as Mark mentioned. It's pretty neat to pass an exam. 
Uh, if you're like me, we're well past that stage in our life. We've got to go study and take an exam, or you do have a 30-year uh, supervisor out in the field, um, and they pass that, they're very proud. Uh, you get them to drink the Kool-Aid, they're more confident in safety. This is coming from them. They, they say, hey, we don't get a, have to run to the safety person all the time. We know what we're doing out there. We're more confident. And uh, the last bullet I like is improves their safety at home. And that's always something that's more and more important. Uh, getting hurt at home or at work doesn't matter. You're still out. Peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, our employees feel like they gain credibility with their coworkers, and they feel more confident in coworkers who have STS. And there's a lot of safety communication when you're STS. You lead a lot more safety meetings, JHA, job planning programs. So it made them more comfortable in, in, in their ability to, to conduct that activity. As a company, we like to show our commitment, you know, clearly to our clients. That's, that makes us maybe a little better company uh, to work for them. It shows our commitment to employees and to employees' families. Uh, as I mentioned before, I don't think we did a, we've done a great job preparing our first-line supervision. So this is a way to help them succeed. We're committing to them um, this process. And the last one is really important for, for the operational side of our company is having STS on a project. We don't have to have a safety professional if it's a small job or a back shift, night shift. So it really comes in handy when you can run the job with the people who are there, who are certified. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a good, effective way to run work. So for AECOM, we have 5,000 STS. They're not all employed today. People leave, we don't mind. We hope they carry STS forward and to their new setting, to, to, to their new employer. Um, we're the national leader for STS. There's, there's no company that has more. But you know who's second? The iron workers. And you guys only started two years ago. So, so that's very exciting for us uh, to, to have that effort come to our work sites. Um, quite frankly, I hope there's pressure on the other unions to follow suit. Real quickly, we've had 88% reduction in workers' comp and 88% reduction in injuries. This, this is over a span since we started uh, seriously STS about 10 to 12 years ago. It saves money, and it it's proves out in the lagging indicators, but our leading proactive processes are outstanding because of the STS. We have 14 OSHA VPP sites, and every one of them has been recognized by OSHA as a best practice having STS. And again, from the company line, non-safety line, it differentiates AECOM, and it helps us win more work, okay? And that is important for, for, for me as an employee and all of us who work on our projects. So with that, I have a short video from one of my executives who uh, is really a, a safety champion and uh, he wanted to say a few words about the STS. Hello, I'm Al Mock, Senior Vice President with AECOM Power Group Operations. Thank you for the opportunity to say a few things about the Safety Trained Supervisor Program. Personally, I've been SDS certified since 2007. SDS has had positive impact on my vision that a zero incident workplace can exist. It really makes you focus on your responsibility of protecting the well-being of all employees. AECOM initially implemented SDS at the safety and management levels. Later, we pushed it deeper into the organization to project management, supervision, and design engineering where safety can be designed into the project from the very beginning. On the Detroit Edison Monroe Environmental Program, which spanned a 14-year period, we pose a challenge to our staff to have all management and supervision personnel STS certified. The team responded by achieving 100% compliance within a short period of time, with new team members accomplishing the same when they came on board throughout the life of the program. This assisted the staff to help the crews in hazard recognition and provide guidance in minimizing at-risk behavior so incidents can be avoided before they happen. SDS is a program that can be enhanced by the entire organization. At AECOM, our philosophy is that all employees, not just safety professionals or responsible safety, 
And this program allows STS certified people to be equipped with the knowledge and the confidence they need to positively influence safe work practice, no matter what their main job responsibilities are on the project. Thank you again for allowing me to speak about STS, a program that can have positive influence on your safety performance. Very strong. Hello, my name is Mike Lestello. I am the supervisor for safety and industrial hygiene for DTE Energy. So who are we? We're a power utility. We are in Michigan, and if you haven't noticed the way Michigan looks, the lower half of Michigan looks like a, a hand. So DTE Energy is from the thumb to almost the state of Ohio, from Lake Erie to Ann Arbor. That's our power area. It's around two million people for electric and most of the state for gas. Um, and if you look at that geographic, we do include Detroit. My role with DTE Energy is I'm in charge of all the large capital construction projects with the company. FGDs, SCRs, wind, solar, anything that we're doing and we're building to advance our fleet, my organization is in charge of it and we're working to improve. So what we're going to go over is a case study over Unit 1 and 2 FGD project in the Monroe Power Plant. Now the Monroe Power Plant is one of the largest coal-fired power plants in the world. Uh, it has three 3,800 megawatt units, I'm sorry, four 3,800 megawatt units that operate daily. Um, the amount of power that comes out of that and with that and our Fermi nuclear power plant is roughly 60 to 70 percent of our entire fleet. We have nine different uh, power facilities up and down the waterway. So what we did on this project, AECOM, what we set up with them was to set up a safety program for this work. On this work, we moved about 2,500 tons of steel, 1,400 tons of duct work, 40,000 linear foot of pipe, 20,000 foot of cable tray, and 600,000 foot of cable. A lot of work, a lot of activities, a lot of things going on. Some of the equipment you, we used, M16,000 crane, 4100 crane, triple eights, gold hoffers, various mobile cranes. The reason we went with bigger cranes is what we did is in our constructability, safety through design, we built a lot of stuff on the ground and picked it up as big components. Instead of putting workers way up in the air, we kept them lower. A lot of work we were able to do out of man lifts, which kept the workers safer. So why did we do this? What's the focus of most construction sites? You want to eliminate injuries. We weren't worried about eliminating injuries. We were looking at at-risk behaviors and unsafe conditions. If we drive those two factors, the injuries will fall in line incidents will fall in line. So why do I do this? So my history, my story is, you know, my family is union tradesmen. I come from a family of tradesmen. My father was a plumber. I have uncles and cousins that are and were fitters, and I have uncles and cousins that are and were iron, wor iron workers. So you can kind of imagine at family events, me being the safety guy, I usually get most of the ridicule from everyone in the family. Um, but what I remember growing up is going to funerals of, of friends of the family who fell in the hole. I remember uh, um, going to the hospital to see my uncle when a wall fell on him. This is why I do this work. This is why we move for at-risk behaviors and unsafe conditions. So how did we take care of this on our job site? So when I go to our job site, I don't see workers, I see my family. Um, what I look for, what we pushed was the 100% of the staff with the STS. And when you look at staff, that doesn't mean superintendents. That was general foreman, foreman, and we even got into some of the, the regular craft doing STS. It became an important part. Other things we did while we were on the job site, Michigan OSHA, we set up a partnership. Much like this is a partnership between the iron workers, general contractors and owners, we set one up with the regulators, our contractors, and us on our site. 
incredible benefits from that. We work together, we were able to get a lot of things accomplished, and when OSHA comes knocking on the door at your job site, most people are afraid and don't want to let them in. We were, ended up being very welcoming to them. They helped us out a lot on our project to make us better. We did health and wellness stations. We had things posted around the job site. And the new employee mentoring, touch a little bit on that. We weren't worried about how long you are a tradesman. The new employee mentoring was how long you've been on our job site. If you were new to our site, you were assigned a mentor. We've all been to job sites where the safety culture is different. You go to some sites, safety culture is very low. You come to this one, we had a very strong culture. We wanted to make sure for the first few months we mentored that person into our culture. It wasn't to teach them how to do their work, it was so they understood how we wanted that to be done safely. Other techniques we had was the stretch and flex, which a lot of people, you're starting to see that happen. Um, good catch recognition program. We rewarded workers for catching unsafe acts, unsafe conditions. None of it was punitive. What they did is if they saw something, they addressed it, took care of that issue, they were put into a system for a reward for that. We weren't looking for names, we just wanted to make sure things were being taken care of. We see it all the time, we're out on job sites, it's easy to find someone who had a lapse, error in judgment, or a condition that was bad and was taken care of and corrected. We also established a thing called safety topic or word of the day. What we used this program for was it was part of the pre-job brief. And it was an embedded test for us. So when we'd go out into the field and we were walking around and we were talking to the workers, did they know what that safety topic of the day was? If they didn't understand and didn't remember that, you have to think, what did they remember from their pre-job brief? So that's how we were able to tell and gauge how active people were in their pre-jobs. If we found people who did not understand that word, didn't remember, they weren't in trouble. There wasn't any punitive uh, discipline for that. What we did is we got back with their foreman and they went over their brief again. First thing in the morning, there's a lot of times your mind's somewhere else. This was able to get them refocused on what they were doing, keep our people safe. Other areas, we did a lot of human performance factors training and that was with the entire craft, everyone who was out there. Peer-to-peer -peer observations, which most of you are familiar with. Craft safety representatives. This was a unique item that we pushed towards our management. We took a worker from every discipline and we made them a safety person. We trained them. We took them out of the field. We took them off the tools. And what they did was they walked around as safety people. How this started, <clears throat> the initial part of this, was you would have the iron workers would only look at iron workers, pipe fitters would only police pipe fitters and they would take care of that. But as this developed and as this continued, what you found out, they became safety reps for everyone. If someone had an issue or a problem, they didn't care what craft they came from, they knew they would take care of the issue. We worked with them and mentored them and it was a very successful program for us. Um, safety and design, constructability, we've kind of already discussed that, John touched on that, and a lot of that was modularization, to keep the people from being too high and in certain situations that can get a little bit hairier, different type of predicaments. So when we originally did this case study, this was for unit one and two of the FGD. Like I said, we have four units there. Units three and four were the first two units we did on the FGD, and the common buildings were all built and their systems were all put in place for the three and four jobs. So this says 400,000 hours without a days away case, one recordable injury on the one and two side. We had a worker walking on a sidewalk and they, there was a pebble on the sidewalk and they rolled their ankle and broke it. Um, still an injury, it was still someone at the job site, still needed to take care of it, but it wasn't a point of activity type of an injury. If we look at all of the units of the FGD, we worked over three million man hours on these jobs. Our recordable rate was a 0.7, which is, you know, which is an industry leader, um, an excellent rate. If you look at that compared to construction, 
the latest BLS is around three. So we were far below. And how we drove this were these safety observations. The field reps were out doing observations. They were looking at stuff. And they were looking at safe acts. We counted safe acts, safe conditions, instead of unsafe acts and unsafe conditions. So if you look at this back in 2012, we weren't even at, we weren't below 90% of safe acts. People work safely. It's the attention to details that sometimes we all have little details that we change depending on where we're at and how we were raised and what we've learned. And as you can tell over the years, we got that close up to 100%. Our field safety reps, our craft safety reps, ended up pretty bored towards the end because they weren't finding many things, which is exactly what we were hoping for. We wanted them to be bored. People were doing the right things and people were going home safe. So with this, what we've established at DTE Energy is we're starting to work our construction field foreman, our construction personnel through STS ourselves. We haven't implemented this throughout the company, but we're doing it on our construction sites. We have a lot of work, we have a lot of things that we're doing, and, and we're trying to push the STS and make sure we have the right training and the right things for our people going into the field. Because a lot of times we're going out into the field and we're seeing the workers that came from our job site from the FGD and we're finding them there. Uh, one of the, the things that I really enjoyed going the, through this over the years was as this job would go, we would have you know different phases of work. And I remember, and this was one of the iron workers that came up to me, he was on the initial part of the job, he left and he came back and he came to me and he made the comment, I was looking forward to this job because you guys were doing it right. He was on other jobs and waiting to come back to the DTE FGD projects because he knew how we portrayed safety for the members. So a lot of things that I've brought up here, we've discussed a lot of stuff, but the STS assisted with implementing all these programs the training, the knowledge, the experience, without any of that, these other things we implemented never would have taken hold. We didn't have to go through from square one because we had certified, trained professionals on the site. The mentoring program kicked off well because everyone understood the culture aspect of it more than just follow the rules. They knew what we were trying to portray. So what I take from this, the STSC is a great tool. It's a great tool for you guys to use, implement, and drive through your systems, drive through your companies. And what you're preventing or what you're changing is your family member not hearing about someone in the hole or someone hurt. They're hearing about the successes, going around and looking at all the things that we've built and enjoying retirement parties. Those are the best way, those are the best ones to have. Um, last thing I want to do is uh, have another short video. This is Dan Farr. Dan Farr is our director of our large environmental and gas capital projects. He was in charge of the FGD. Um, he's in charge of a lot of the things that we're doing throughout our company for our construction. If we'll roll that video, please. So construction site safety. This is such an important aspect of any major contract work that we do within DTE Energy. When we think about the safety trained supervisors that this program provides for, it's amazing what we can get out of it when our supervisors are really focused on understanding what needs to be done by the craft and what their oversight can provide when they do this work. These supervisors, remember, came from the craft, are most typically and very knowledgeable in this area. So when we were approached by this joint venture with both the DTE and URS to improve our overall safety record on our scrubber projects and our SCR projects at our Monroe Station, we were very, very pleased to move forward with this safety trained supervisor application. We are very focused to make sure that these supervisors have as our first line of awareness what needs to be accomplished by the craft and bring that hazard identification into focus. 
We once told a story about don't be that guy or be that guy. And the difference is, is how the first line supervisor will interact with their craft and their team that they're responsible for. Because what we want from that supervisor is safety awareness, ensure they deliver great quality work. And at the end of the day, that craft member goes home just as safe as the way they arrived. Can you believe there's people in our company that confuse he and I? He has a different barber than I do. Um, questions at the end here. Uh, we have a few minutes to probably take any questions. If we don't have any right now and you have questions, you can approach any of us throughout the conference. Our contact information is in the system. And the BCSP does have a booth here. Uh, they have all the information. They have a lot of the paperwork on the STSC certification there. Uh, there's microphones in the aisle. Um, I do like the training. Um, the one thing I would say, how do you build that support network after the training, and how do you go ahead and keep that focus after you go ahead and have the training? How do you go ahead and make that happen? As, a, as in the aspect of the project or just in the membership? In the aspect of the supervisor. How does he go ahead and get that support that he's being put within after the training? You guys want to go over that? We've sort of coined a uh, phrase in AECOM, and it's STS, what's next? Because people ask us, okay, I, ha I, ha I have this credential now. So they are automatically engaged in our committees, safety walks, um, all the little leadership at activities that we have in the safety, safety program. So in fact, it's pretty much a requirement that you map out your involvement in safety um, for this year and next year and the, in the coming years as an STS person. So uh, that's worked for us. Um, obviously our upper leadership, you know, it, they're, they're running hard with it, pushing it, you know, for us. But at the, at the uh, project level, we, we, we give them sometimes assignments or opportunities to get involved in safety. So we, so we leverage that.